Um, I have to admit I will change scale again um, and um, try to speak a little bit not only as an architect but also as like an inhabitant of this planet. This is somehow the title, I changed it many, many times. <laughs> And uh, this is ongoing, of course, as m most of our thinking. Um, in the course uh, of our research uh, work uh, for the Swiss portraits uh, for Switzerland from 1999 and uh, to 2004 in the uh, Studio Basel, and on one of our various field trips in the Alpine reg region of Switzerland, and I discovered those strange and audacious constructions. And through this, I came across with the work of Elinor Ostrom. In the 90s, Törbel, which is a mountain village in the Swiss Alps, a remote uh, village, is the subject of scientific research first by the anthropologist Robert Nettling, and later Nobel laureate um, Elinor Ostrom, I mentioned already. Netting was one of the first to analyze a municipality in terms of human ecology. The village community was studied as an ecosystem that regulates itself through economic practices, demographics, and auto-governance. Ostrom investigates the use of the Turbel Commons, which was regulated by the statues of the 15th century. In particular, she is intrigued by the rules for the sustainable land use, such as pastures, forests, etc., as well as the communal maintenance of paths and bieses, as they are called, Suonen, also in German, in the Valais, those are irrigation systems. Uh, after her studies at, in Turbel, in Switzerland, in the Swiss mountain, uh, she studied a lot of different places through the whole globe in California, like groundwater systems in the Philippines, etc. And at the end, um, she brought this all together in, his, in her book, uh, Governing the Commons. In this book, she shows uh, what sustainable management of community assets like such fisheries, pastures, etc., could look like. She comes to the conclusion that the exploitation of natural resources takes place sustainably under certain conditions when organized independently of the influence of the free market and the state interventionism. Ostrom, for that, receives the Nobel Prize to the fact that a large part of her research work aims to demonstrate the best quality of environmental resilience of common spaces and common goods managed in a common mode. So here you see the Turbel, and um, this shows the view of the commune of Turbel, which has a village and, of course, pastures um, and um, forests, etc. So that's the managing of this piece of land by the community of Turbel. Now, uh, is, is it a contemporary relevance about that? Yes, today the downturn of agriculture in the Alps means that in many cases consorts are no longer directly involved in the management of the land use and of the irrigation systems. Nevertheless, consorts have to deal with new players and new issues, such as tourism, hydroelectric companies, associations for the protection of the environment and landscape. The members of the consorts are also the holders of know-how, skills and competencies, as well as the governance of commons. The latter are not fixed in the past, but are still evolving. However, the original purpose of a consortage remains the same, to ensure optimal exploitation of the natural resources while sustaining them in the long term. 
Ostrom-Harding-Debate. That's the book. I, I, I forgot to see. So that's her book, Governing the Commons. And then there was in the 70s, there was this debate between Hardin, Garrett Hardin, and Eleanor Ostrom. And um, <clears throat> Ostrom somehow frees um, the commons from the curse of Hardin that had weight on the commons. In a 1968 essay, you see here on the right, in the journal Science, entitled The Tragedy of the Commons, with question mark, the microbiologist and ecologist Garrett Harding formulates the explicit parable of the egoistic shepherd who drives more and more uh, animal onto a common pasture until the latter is ruined by overuse. According to Hardin, the tragedy of the commons is the rational and selfish people plunder and overuse national resources and thus ultimately destroy them. Ostrom, on the other hand, was able to show that commons develop collectively accepted rules that effectively prevent overuse of natural resources. Ostrom drew for the first time the attention of science to structural elements and patterns of action and governance, which, with which commons are successfully managed by communities all over the globe, as I said. Then the market state duopoly. She also spoke about this, um, that dualism as public versus private, state versus market, are generally taken for granted. We see them as opposites. These two are relics, lexical legacies that obscure the relational. The fact that one is inextricably, another, interdependencies inextricably linked to the other. These dualisms are still entrenched in our thinking. And when we consider the range of solutions that are generally considered plausible, either or, they say all or nothing. Thus, the language of our time blesses its purpose and power relations and lails our thinking with a board that is difficult to pierce. The political debate in the Western world is still proceeding along those lines of the market-state duopoly. More state and less market, or the other way around, less state and more market. This simplistic market-state dichotomy takes hold of our policies. Conventional political discourses are not able to adequately name our problems, to formulate alternatives, much less to sketch visions. The pitfalls of the current dominant political language are tightly drawn at the price of growing socio-economic and political polarizations. Now beyond market and state, the commons, a third way. Ostrom emphasizes this, that a common is not only a thing, but back is not only an adjective um, and not only a thing, but is also a verb. So, but what do we mean by commons? Ah, sorry, this is the other way around. So, um, there is some ambiguity, I, I agree, in how the term commons is being used. It is close to what is called an umbrella term, covering a wide-ranging subject. It is, a common, it is common to use umbrella terms mainly in casual or layman situations. Why is this so? Because on the one hand, we speak of commons, which is a very precise concept of economic theory and political sciences. And on the other hand, we speak of the commons, which is much more generic. It is truly impressive how in 10 years, the vocabulary related to the commons has spread among people from very diverse social, geographical spaces and intellectual background, 
just to name a few that come to my mind now, the Common Ground at the Viennese Biennale, Imminent Commons, the Seoul Biennale, and also we heard it today, the Urban Rural Commons of uh, Atelier Bauwau in Japan. Um, so it is an adjective, it is a noun, it is a verb, and it is an activity. It's sharing by a community of commoners, a, a commune, a, a shared piece of land, for instance. It reinforced the notion that the commons is a process, is a path, is a path in constant movement. Furthermore, we do not possess, we do not have a commons. We are part of a commons. Insofar as we are part of an ec ecosystem, of a set of relations in an urban and rural environment, and therefore the subject is part of the object. There can be a very clear formula uh, for what a common is. A common is a resource plus a community plus a set of social protocols. The cop, sorry, I think I'm immer zurück. That's the, sorry, sorry. So now, that's what's the one. So, and of course, um, the digital world will not be possible without this thinking about this, about that would go too far to go more in detail into this, but um, of course the digital world gives us uh, huge, huge possibilities in sharing things, in sharing knowledge, um, and so on. So, I'm coming back now to Switzerland, to the more real. This is a photo of the Valais. And um, I would like, uh, with my contribution also today, is coming back to Switzerland and having um, want to show and to speak about two concrete projects uh, of Herzog and Dömeron that we um, live and we experience this notion of the commons like you do in, in Japan, Momori. And so that's in... Um, in Sion, in Valais, which you see that the territory, the landscape is being built, is, is, a, is not anymore a nature uh, state, but it is a natural state, it is huge, hugely architectural. Um, so, the, this first project is in, uh, in Sion, in the canton of Valle in Switzerland. The second one is in Natal, in Brazil. And the one is quite close to us. The other one is much farther, but as much dear and close as this one. I will speak in a second uh, about the Natal project. So, so you have Sion in the canton of Valle. And this is one of our analyses of the Swiss uh, portrait, where we have been developing those different typology, but this is again not the subject today. But what I would like to see here with Sion is that uh, Sion um, and the whole canton of Valais is built up of so-called designs so or district, where you have uh, perpendicular to the Valais du Rhône, which is running from the uh, right to the left, from the east to the south, e west. And every town, every township in Valais was a Disa, was a district. And what is interesting with that, that the cities, the towns, they were on their own in the valley, and they had their back land, they had their hinterland. So what is quite important, yes, for us and for our approach is that a city is not just to be understood as a city, but as a city plus its territory. So it is about the urban and about the rural. And this is a very old way to see that, to understand what is a territory. And this is certainly something that was very interesting to uh, develop um, also further in, in this project. 
So it is a territorial planning. City planning is not city planning, is not urban planning, but we always have to consider um, it in a larger scale, understanding that the both the rural and um, the urban, they are tightly linked together. They are also dependent on each other. So doing this project, of course, then first we, we looked at the territory at large. I show the Dufour Karte because I think the Dufour shows very well the, um, the, the spaces and the, um, the, the, the nature of the nature of the mountains with the valley in, in the center, white, the valley, and then the, the higher mountains around it. So that would be like the larger territory around Sion with what you see when you are in Sion, when you are on the site of our project. We want to integrate this territory into the project. This is what you see all around. And then in the valley itself, the, 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 the era is an industrial era that is now to be transformed into a city. We start with the, with the relief and with the hydrology. So what is the paysage, what is the landschaft, what is the landscape, how is it then the green. I don't want to much uh, now go too much into detail also with this one, but that you have on the right and on the left of the road, you have the agriculture fields, and with this project we would like now to bring those two eras together in the city itself, which is now very mineral, a city which is very hot also because it's, there's not many green pieces. What we also see here in comparison, Ronco is uh, almost one-sixth of the whole, uh, one-tenth of the whole era of, of Sion, so quite for this uh, small city is uh, quite a big uh, pr um, uh, project, and so we had to define some uh, vision for that. A there was a political vision first, and then there was an architectural vision with this idea of a grand parc in the center of, of, the, of the era, which you see here. Um, of course, it has to do with a lot of we have been discussing. It's about mobility, it's about climate, etc., etc., so that also this green space allows now the, the winds now to um, make also the climate better. Then the activities is mixed use, of course, but now it's monofunctional, it's industrial, it's, and now it, the neighborhood should then um, transform into a piece of the city. Those are, of course, now the main targets of this project. Um, and, of course, also remaining and retaining and reusing existing, um, existing buildings, most of the existing buildings. Of course, the Rhone, which is very close, is also to make the access to the Rhone possible. But again, this is not why I show this project. I would rather show it um, also as a, how to implement uh, such uh, a large project for a, a city like Sion. So we introduce also the name or the notion of a plan guide and not of a master plan. So the plan guide has some guidelines and then it can be uh, developed in sectors um, or, and in phases. As you see here, the sectors and the phases, and then one after the other, the different sectors can be developed. So this um, seen from the air, Ronco, as it may be in a few years, and what I already said is that they are like, um, the, maybe up to now, the, the way how to develop projects in, um, in cities like in Barcelona or Paris was a very, let's say, uh, top-down um, top model where you have like someone who decides and then you have a result as a master plan, which I think is not anymore... Uh, the right name to give it. Uh, that's why we call it uh, Plan Guide, because a master is somehow who knows. I know, I'm the master, I know uh, how, how a city looks like. And then you have on the right, you have like many individuals, so it's like a kind of a given how to do it, and the other one is like you leave it open with all the different individuals within a society. And um, we have been thinking, is there not also a third model now to develop a city, whether it's this one or somewhere else. And so we have the Plan Guide, 
and the stakeholders is the territory, as I said, plus, of course, the Ville de Sion and the landowners. And to develop a convention like uh, for the consortage, so that you know what are your duties, what are your rights when you are an owner and you want to develop your parcel. Um, of course, they also, as it is a, a new piece of a city, it will for, for 10,000 inhabitants, you need technical and social infrastructures. There are 187 parcels. And what we did, we analyzed every parcel, what it is worth. What's the price, according to now the economic um, models, what's the price of it? And we then went to the landowners and told them, look, if you develop your land now according to the plan guide, then that's what it means to you. So we have this, try to find the balance between the Ville de Sion and the landowners. So that's the current zoning. Then the plan guide allows for more height, for more density. So, speaking of the infrastructures I mentioned before, this is additional charges for whom? For the government, for the city, for the state. And an added value for the landowners. So that was a, quite a disbalance. And what we proposed is that the landowners, uh, according to a Mehrwertabgabe, as we call it in German, they give something to the, to the city if they develop their, their plot of land according to the plan guide. Um, when I make this presentation in front of the, the, the Grand Conseil, so the legislative authority, I show this, but then also I showed that one. And that was like 10 years before when we did the study on the on the Swiss portrait, we discovered this, those commoners, and I thought this was quite telling to show me as an urban, you know, coming from Basel, showing this to the Valais people, and they at, at once, they understood what it is about. It is about the wider landscape, it is about the commoners, and it is about the architectural product, okay? And it was really interesting when we presented it to all the 187 landowners, how this became like. They, they at once, they started to, 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 to discuss and to, to, to exchange ideas uh, with their neighbors and not fight against them. The second project, I already mentioned it, is an urban vision for May Luisa in Natal in Brazil, um, is on the coast on the north east coast of, of Brazil, and Mao Luisa is an informal settlement um, in, in, um, in, in Natal. It's also a threat of development. You mentioned that, you know, the development of the economics of, of promoters and developers who, of course, on the coastline, they want to develop. Um, um, the, the interesting, you mentioned the valuable land um, in, in Bogota, in, in Africa. And here, if you look at that one, this is, if you see the, the favela, the informal settlement is very close to the shore, which at the same time is also very attractive for development, like the one that you see uh, here on, the, on this image. And there is a clash between those two worlds, between the informal settlement and between and the high-rise building. Also there, we had a lot, a lot of, of um, exchange and a lot of discussions with the people there, with um, the community there, and uh, try to engage them into, into the development of their, of, their, of their settlement. So what we proposed is a kind of um, a guideline also for the development of the, of the settlement, where you have on the left the protected dunes and the Atlantic Ocean, and uh, to propose um, uh, perpendicular to the main street, to propose a kind of a passerella, as we call it, and which also brings uh, different facilities, public facilities together, which are, of course, uh, lacking uh, in this era, you can imagine, we know what it means. So, this was like the urban idea of the whole, 
of the whole uh, project um, and to also the, the informal, you mentioned that with the green, this green, um, green street, which is also one of the main axes through the settlement. Then we were commissioned. So the Arena Domore is a pioneering architectural project, um, and Susan and I will speak a little bit also as an architect now, <laughs> as you say you. So the Arena is um, a big white roof, and containing different activities with this also curvilinear wall, which has uh, like the wardrobes, etc., for more privacy. And it has mainly this big roof, which is uh, built um, out of steel, and that is covering and creates now a symbolic uh, place also for the whole neighborhood. It has, uh, gives an identity to the whole thing. As also, as you described it, uh, for Japan, we tried to do it with the means and with the possibilities which are there, and not to import any knowledge, but to work with what they know and what they can do on the site. And as you see, so that was also something that the people there built up themselves, this curvilinear wall. So, and at night, it has then this lantern-like, because it's uh, translucent, it has openings it's for ventilation, for the hot winds, etc. And at night, it shows then like a lantern into um, the urban landscape. Now, I have uh, some final notes. And um, perhaps what makes it this term, the common, so popular, so interesting and appealing, um, too, is the evidence that there is no one and only answer to the social problems, such as migration, inequities, uh, discriminations of all kinds and many others, and that we are fully facing now and uh, will be increasingly facing in the next future. The state's response to the social problems is called into question, for my opinion, first of all, because the state seems to be less and less able to respond effectively to the ongoing challenges. The dynamics of economics globalization strongly destabilize state institutions that have, per se, a well-defined territorial foundation. Moreover, the prevailing feeling is that the way of responding of the state is a bureaucratic logic and is by that on the mode of delegation, so to say, to decide and to do on behalf of others. By its own nature, this ends up discouraging people from getting involved in the questions, in the subject matters which they are their own. What predominates in this attitude is the mode of admitting, admitting how things are going and that personal involvement is no longer in demand. Which is exactly the opposite of what is urgently needed today, namely to find something that expresses the collective, that brings us closer to an idea of the public affairs that does not necessarily have to identify with the institu institutional system. The commons would therefore represent the need to rebuild this kind of space of links, of, humans rela of human relations, of relationships and basics that constitute the collective. I think that this is a plausible explanation of why we are now talking about a notion that undoubtedly has a lot of accounts and a narrative behind it and which re reappears today with force, albeit with other readings and other meanings. We are all part of the system, and as acting suspects, we are just as much all part of the problem. Astonishingly, economy understood as an overall system doesn't handle production, investments, consumption and resources in the same literally economical way. When planning, designing, constructing and manufacturing, the minimum requirement must be to seek, find and produce climate and socially compatible answers. Across a disciplinary boundaries and in the creative play between knowledge as a collective heritage, united imagination and collaborative activity, not only ecological stability, 
but also social cohesion are at stake. In this context, the muted model of alpine labor and property collectives could take a new significance. Commons should not be understood nostalgically, but existentially, through the human ability and willingness to look ahead, to take precautions and to manage the Earth's sustainability. The focus is on society, economy and territory, which form a binding whole. Um, innovati innovative Denkmodelle, no novel uh, thinking models, give a new impetus to design and planning, just like the lemon and the light bulb in Boy's multiple Capri battery. By the way, it's almost the same color as the your color on the poster of the... <sighs> That I didn't know. Clever ideas and things are created that require less energy and less material. Carefully processed and cleverly handled, they are a given a rich meaning with an own particular aesthetic expression. Here, two everyday objects are linked together and thus gain in mental acuity and sensory quality. Free of bias, because solutions are to be questions when you be, uh, we have to, to question and question and question again. And the two components of the Capri battery are the same size, shape and color. And they express this explicit equilibrium. Beuys not only addresses a necessary balance between nature and technology, but also refers to the important role of natural resources. Also, he conveys to the viewer through the usual manual that he himself, the viewer, so the viewer, must become active in order to keep alive the flow of energy through which change is made possible. And he, in the manual, it is written that, sorry, replace the battery after 1,000 hours. So, thank you, and thank you for doing so. Yeah. <laughs>